Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Shifting the Cancer Vaccine Paradigm NGS Best Practices for Developing Personalized Neo Antigen Vaccines. My name is Vicki and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes with time for a QA session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. And if you do require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point, I would like to thank Personalis who helped develop the content for this presentation. Personalis Inc. is a genomic sequencing services provider with a patented ACE accuracy and content enhanced technology that augments coverage in difficult to sequence regions of the genome, such as areas of high GC content. The ACE platform yields the most accurate and comprehensive genetic data for pharmaceutical, biotech, clinical, and academic researchers, providing the most reliable variant identification solution for multiple downstream applications such as immuno-oncology, cancer clinical trials, and clinical diagnostics. Their services for immune oncology include accurate detection of true somatic variants, evaluation of tumor mutational burden, identification of potential neoantigens, and assessment of expression of immune checkpoint genes. And now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Our first speaker is Dr. Aaron Newburn. Dr. Newburn joined Personalis as a field application scientist in 2013 with over 12 years of research experience in the areas of molecular biology, genetics, and biotechnology. As the field applications manager, Aaron's team has a responsibility for providing both pre- and post-sale technical support for the Personalis ACE cancer portfolio. Erin completed her postdoctoral training at the National Institute of Mental Health, investigating candidate susceptibility genes for major psychiatric illnesses. Erin received her PhD from the Ohio State University in Integrated Biomedical Science as a Presidential Fellow. And our next speaker for today is Dr. Christelle Johnson. Dr. Johnson joined Personalis in 2015 as a field application scientist with 10 years of basic and translational research experience in immuno-oncology and genomics, and she has authored over 15 publications in the cancer field. In her role at Personalis, Christelle provides technical support and consumer education on ACE cancer product portfolio. Christelle completed her postdoctoral studies at Harvard Medical School and Cornell University investigating the role of the tumor microenvironment and metabolic pathways in cancer growth and progression. She received her PhD in cancer immunology from the University of Louisville School of Medicine. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand the mic over to our speakers. They may begin when ready. Excellent. Thank you, Vicki, and thanks to those in the audience for this excellent opportunity to present to you today. So here is an overview of how Christelle and I have structured the presentation for today. We're going to start off with a background on our topic and focus on some key best practices to keep in mind with cancer vaccine development. We'll discuss working with FFPE samples for DNA and RNA sequencing and the challenges that are often faced there. We'll also speak to the approach of using an augmented whole exome and whole transcriptome sequencing and also the analytical validation of those types of assays. And then we'll review the needs for processes that have a very timely turnaround time to meet the demands of a cancer vaccine clinical trial. And then we can open up the meeting for some Q&A from, from the audience. 
So first, let's review a bit of background on the immunotherapy field, and in particular, the recent focus on personalized cancer vaccines. So cancer treatment is proving to be very transformational in the area of immuno-oncology and immunotherapy. So these therapies actually augment or fire up our own immune system's ability to fight cancer. And you may have heard that former U.S. President Jimmy Carter was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. Um, this had spread to his liver and his brain, and he was given only several months to live last year. He then received one of these immunotherapies and is now considered to be disease-free. And this is for a type of cancer, melanoma, that has really defied any meaningful treatment in decades past. And this really is a tremendously exciting time out there for precision medicine and for therapy in cancer. In the U.S., the National Cancer Moonshot Initiative is looking to make more therapies available for patients, but also improve the ability to prevent cancer and to try to detect it early. And immunotherapy has also been mentioned as a particular area of focus within this national effort. But the concept of immunotherapy is, is really not new. In fact, it has been around for decades. If we look back to as early as the mid-1800s, Rudolf Virchow um, originally proposed the idea of immune infiltrate in the tumor environment. And then in 1909, Paul Ehrlich <clears throat> postulated that cancer occurs spontaneously in vivo and that the immune system is able to both recognize and protect against it. And today, now we have a, a much better idea of the molecular mechanisms behind what was observed by these early pioneers of immunotherapy. Tumors are eliminated by our immune system by active surveillance, but eventually cancer can escape our immune system. Our immune system recognizes and it's ready to eliminate cancer, but can be held back by these inhibitory receptors or ligands. So tumors can begin to express these immune checkpoint genes, and this creates a way for the tumor to evade the immune system. And this is now a very active area of new drug development strategies, uh, drugs that interrupt these immune checkpoints, such as anti-CTLA-4 or anti-PDL-1 therapies, can work to unleash anti-tumor immunity and really mediate cancer regression. And today we are refining this strategy to try to mount a more durable clinical response by mounting a response that can eliminate tumor cells for an extended period of time. Um, immunotherapies are often categorized into three main areas. The first is immune checkpoints and immune modulators, and currently there are a variety of immune modulators being investigated. The main ones, which I just mentioned, PDL1 and CTLA4, but there are other promising candidates out there as well. There's also a next generation of cancer vaccines, as well as adoptive cell therapies that have been effective for patients. Um, our focus of discussion today is on personalized cancer vaccines or neoantigen-based vaccines. And so while tumor mutational burden is the total number of mutations in the coding region of the tumor genome, a subset of these mutations may result in neoantigens. So these are somatic mutations in cancer that can generate non-self peptides that when they're properly presented on the HLA can be targets for tumor-specific T cell responses. And there have been studies showing that perhaps new antigen burden may be used as a potential predictor of response to immunotherapies. And as an example, shown here was a study published um, last year on patients with non-small cell lung cancer that received anti-PD-1 therapy. And they show a higher percent of progression-free survival in tumors with higher candidate neoantigen burden compared to tumors with a lower candidate neoantigen burden. And neoantigen burden has recently been suggested then as this predictive signature for trying to determine response to immune checkpoint blockade therapies. However, there's another entire application of neoantigens, and a very exciting one, which is in creating truly personalized cancer vaccines. So for personalized cancer vaccine development, you can identify the neoantigen and then create a synthetic vaccine against this neoantigen 
and then provide this vaccine to the patient. So these vaccines can take on many different forms, peptide-based modalities, RNA, or DNA-based. And also, oftentimes, this vaccine is provided in combination with checkpoint blockade therapies, as well as it can be provided with targeted therapies or chemotherapies. And so here, in this example, you have a tumor-specific personalized cancer vaccine that was created for an individual patient. And so despite the, the excitement and momentum that is being gained in cancer vaccine development, there are challenges that we need to keep in mind. For new antigen detection, really a, a broader assay is required. Many commercially available cancer panels of 20 to even 500 genes are, are really just too narrow. And it's important to include an assay that's not just has a broader genomic footprint, but also enables comprehensive variant detection. So many of the conventional assays and sequencing technologies have gaps in coverage that can really lead to less accuracy. For many of these oncology studies, the sample format is often formalin fixed and paraffin embedded, or what we refer to as FFPE, tumor biopsies. And while, while formalin um, treatment can really preserve the tissue, it also damages nucleic acids, and it can really pose a challenge to identifying true variants in the tumor sample for um, using next generation sequencing. And many of these clinical research studies may be dependent upon this type of arch archival tissue that has been fixed using variable methods or using inconsistent procedures. Another challenge is that the assays and informatics used within these new antigen detection approaches are quite complex and really require a strong analytical validation. One of the issues facing the industry is that these that there is this lack of reference standards when performing these validations to use as a, as a ground truth in assessment. And Christelle will be talking more about this. And so the approach to addressing these challenges in cancer vaccine development really needs to be considered in a holistic manner. So by looking at the entire process end to end as you try to take on these challenges, First, optimizing the extraction of both DNA and RNA from the sample, performing enhanced whole exome and whole transcriptome sequencing using sequencing that has been designed to address these quote unquote blind spots of conventional standard NGS for more complete tumor characterization, and also using both advanced assays and advanced bioinformatics and reporting having access to data that has went through a robust analytical validation, and having reports that are designed and tailored to meet the clinical trial or study need. And also ensuring that these critical patient samples will be processed to generate high quality data that is also delivered in a very timely manner. So throughout the presentation today, Christelle and I will be touching and further highlighting and discussing the importance of each of these considerations and how we can take these challenges on. So from this introduction, let's first discuss the ability to work with more challenging sample starting materials for DNA and RNA NGS, such as the ability to work with FFPE specimen in your cancer vaccine development process. So FFP samples are the most common sample type out there for tumor coming from tumor biopsies. Yet, as we know, the, the fixation and chemical modification during the FFPE process can degrade DNA and RNA materials. Patient samples are, are precious and limited, and it's important to really maximize the amount of data you are able to obtain from these materials. And when developing a neoantigen cancer vaccine, it is ideal to utilize both DNA and RNA in the workflow. So how can you assess the sequencing quality from FFPE samples, and what type of metrics should you use in your evaluation? So we'll discuss these criteria next. So for NGS from FFP samples to be useful in immuno-oncology studies, uniform methods and processing for these samples during fixation should occur. So 
there are there are several fixation behaviors that can negatively affect the DNA and RNA quality, and we have these listed here. So these these can include the time and duration of fixation. So fixing samples for over 24 hours have found to be has been found to be detrimental. Also, the temperature used in this process can have an effect. So fixation should occur at room temperature as higher temperatures are really not recommended. Also using fresh reagents that are in date and not expired as this can alter quality. Storing tissue properly prior to fixation is also critical. So samples should be fixed immediately or snap frozen until fixed. And although microwaving FFPE slides is a common practice for immunohistological studies, it is not recommended for samples that are slated for genomic testing. And laboratories can, can help and provide specimen preparation guidance for FFPE. For example, at Personalis, we have a guideline document for best practices. So we recommend using a highly freshly prepared 10% formalin in PBS solution fixing overnight at a room temperature. So this procedure can optimize successful isolation of both high quality DNA and RNA from these samples. And so there are several metrics to help you determine the quality of the data from sequencing FFPE samples. So some metrics that can be considered in this evaluation are, are shown here on the slide. So looking at the percentage of mapped reads or how many reads align to the reference, looking at the QMAP score. So the QMAP score shows the probability that a read is, is misplaced. Or you can look at the, the QBase score, which is the probability score of an error in base calling. And as you can see, this, this was from a recent project of FFP samples performed at Personalis. And using our enhanced whole exome um, sequencing, the uh, DNA sequencing quality was high with these samples, as about 90% of the samples have had, had high results on the percentage of mapped reads, QMAP score, and QBase score values. So also, for RNA, there are metrics to examine as well. So the percentage of reads mapping to the reference genome, or here this is what we refer to as the fraction map. You can also look um, to see those reads that map to the region of most interest, such as looking at the percentage mapping to the exonic region, and look at the fraction of ribosomal RNA-free reads. And so from recent FFP projects that we extracted RNA and performed our ACE cancer transcriptome, we looked at these sequencing QC metrics, and these results helped to qualify these as high-quality sample sets. And also, you can look at, for RNA-seq, you can look at the uniformity in sequencing coverage across the transcript, and this can provide some insight into the data quality. So in, in this slide, you're looking at transcript coverage plots, and each of these different colored lines on the plots represents a different sample in the study. And as you can see, the performance of the RNA-seq data is very uniform across the transcript from the five prime to the three prime end. So whether we started with a fixed sample, and that's the plot shown here on the top panel, or a, a frozen specimen, and this is the plot shown here on our bottom panel. And so we have kind of the typical five prime and three prime end fading. We really avoid the three prime end biases that is often seen using a poly A enrichment. So, so next, I'd like to focus more on the sequencing coverage and how critical it is to have accurate uniform sequencing assays as coverage gaps can lead to missing neoantigen targets. And so how do you, you know, get at these neoantigens? How do you assess these? What, what kind of assays do you use? And, and what do you consider in your selection? So first, the, the existing cancer diagnostic panels are really too limited for neoantigen detection. Um, these existing assays are narrow. They were typically designed to cover the key cancer driver genes. 
However, neoantigens can and often reside outside of the typical cancer gene list and can really reside in any gene, even housekeeping genes out there. And so deciding what genomic footprint is needed then for neoantigen load assessment is an interesting question. And this was raised from this recent study in genome medicine that was published earlier this year. So in the study, when they looked at the ability to predict new antigen load from cancer patient samples using whole exome sequencing as compared to using a large panel, the new antigens predicted from this large 300 gene panel were very limited, as, as most of these new antigens occurred in genes not found on typical cancer panels. So again, you need a Oftentimes with detecting these neoantigens, the technology is limited um, by incomplete coverage of genes, and this then could lead to missing potential mutations. So it's important not only that you need a broad assay, but you also need an assay that's more complete and more accurate. And all of these pieces then can lead to limitations in the downstream bioinformatics and analysis for really doing accurate predictions of neoantigens. So let's talk further about whole exome sequencing. So standard whole exome sequencing assays have gaps and inconsistencies in coverage. For example, this is a sequencing plot of the STK11 gene using the standard exome assay, the Agilent Clinical Research Exome Assay. And this plot shows all the exons concatenated together and the read depth is shown here on the y-axis. And if we look across this gene, gene-wide, you have these peaks and valleys in sequencing coverage. You have areas that are very sufficiently covered and others that maybe are suboptimal. And also what you notice is although this gene is sequenced to high depth, so it's in this case an average of greater than 100x coverage, it's still, the standard assay, it still fails to cover whole exonic regions, and this is shown here by, by the red brackets here on my slide. So variants residing in these regions would be undetected and would be completely missed with a standard assay. So we've recognized these issues with the standard exome and built an ACE exome design that works by taking the standard exome, shown here in blue, and adding supplemental coverage in green. These are then combined in an effort to maximize genomic content and provide uniformity in coverage to really increase confidence in calling variants accurately. And not only do we target exonic content, but we've also added coverage of biomedically important regions outside the exon, such as placing capture probes in regulatory regions, intergenic, and intronic variants. So by design, we've addressed issues with the standard exome chemistry to result in more accurate uniform coverage, but also our design is content enhanced as, as well. So if we go back to SDK11, and I like to show this because this is a nice visual of the quality of data that you would receive from an augmented exome approach such as what we provide at Personalis. Is we provide you with the blue, which is shown here, plus the green, the supplemental coverage demonstrated here on this sequencing coverage plot. So blue plus green, you have more accurate, more uniform coverage. So the gaps where you see no blue coverage in the sequencing depth with the standard assay are now filled in by this approach um, to give you more complete, more uniform sequencing data. And with our exome augmentation approach, we go beyond the cancer driver genes, and we finish over 8,000 biomedically important genes where random somatic mutations can occur. So here are just a few more sequencing plots just to show you a nice visual of a variety of genes with gaps, inconsistencies that are nicely filled in with our ACE technology, and this is particularly important for immuno-oncology studies. And as we just showed here, not all exomes are created equal. And efforts within the Precision FDA have made it their mission to work with the genomics community in creating a conscious effort to set standards for more consistent results for genomic testing. And when you're evaluating sequencing quality, it's important to look for this uniformity in sequencing coverage across genes. And keep in mind that metrics such as 
high average coverage are truly just averages and there can be gaps in coverage, peaks and valleys in the sequencing coverage as I like to call them, uh, as we just showed here with the STK11 gene example. And also increasing the sequencing depth and just sequencing to a very high depth does not solve the problem, as often there's areas in the genomic architecture that are just difficult to capture with standard technologies. And sequencing higher would just add to the regions already covered well. It's also important to look for publications and literature out there on the assay performance. And the Precision FDA is also putting forth efforts to create tools to help assess and make it more easy to compare sequencing results. And recently from the literature, this, this was shown. So our augmented exome approach was highlighted and described in a Nature Reviews genetics article by Dr. Ewan Ashley. So in the article, Ashley describes many of the potential concerns in moving NGS data into the clinical space and specifically mentions the problems of hard to sequence regions in medically important genes like GC rich regions and discusses accurately assessing sequencing performance. And a figure from this paper shows the sequencing performance of several available exome assays out there, including our personalis ACE exome, which is shown here at the top. So here, the American College of Medical Genetics uh, 56 most actionable genes have been plotted as individual events here along the x-axis, so each of these ticks. And then the number of missed bases using each exome method is shown here on the y-axis, so this is bases not covered. And you can see here that our augmented exome approach, our ACE exome in the first plot, has the lowest number of missed bases in each of these genes when compared to other standard exomes. So in a head-to-head -head comparison of ACE to other commercial offerings, our technology resulted in improved sequencing of the ACMG uh, gene set, so with higher sensitivity. And this figure was taken from the tool that's being developed and designed by the Precision FDA. So again, here it allows you to easily compare the performance across different assays. And from that same article, here is a coverage plot of the coding region for a single gene, KCNH2, using a standard exome and compared to our augmented approach here shown on the bottom. So our ACE Methodology filled in gaps, allowing more confident interrogation of variants within KCNH2. So KCNH2 is a gene associated with short and long QT syndrome. And although KCNH2 is not a cancer driver gene, this plot does provide a proof of principle of the importance of augmented coverage in order to fully interrogate a critical gene of interest. So now, um, likewise, I'd, I'd like to talk about um, RNA-seq. So accurate identification of the express somatic variants via whole transcriptome sequencing is critical as you are defining your genomic solutions for vaccine development. So as mentioned earlier, in many of these cancer studies, FFPE speci specimen are the materials available for analysis. In the past, these sample types have been quite challenging for genomic and transcriptomic studies. And typical enrichment methods for RNA sequencing, like poly-A or using ribodepletion, have some known limitations, such as inconsistent removal of ribosomal RNA or the inability to work with a more degraded material. And methods such as an exome capture transcriptome, like the ACE cancer transcriptome, allows you to overcome these limitations, um, allowing you to work with a more degraded sample and work with the sample sparing methodology. And this approach would give you strand-specific information as well. And so data generated from this approach is very clean and results in the majority of the bases aligning to the exonic region as compared to using a, a ribodepletion method. So the blue color here on the bar chart shows that on, on the left here that the majority of the bases are mapping to the exonic region with the ACE cancer transcriptome approach here. While with a ribodepletion protocol, you have a large number of, of off-target reads. So the ACE cancer transcriptome focuses on the regions of interest for more complete, comprehensive detection of 
expressed variants. And again, RNA-seq, it's, it's quite critical for new antigen detection as you want to determine if these variants are, are definitely expressed. And so using an exome capture transcriptome process, here are four different cancer genes, and this enables more sensitive detection of somatic variants. So in blue, you can see the transcriptome coverage using a, a standard RNA-seq methodology, whereas using an optimized exome capture transcriptome protocol, which would be the blue plus the green, provides more sequencing coverage across these critical cancer genes for really increased sensitivity. And so far we've discussed, in general, some of the challenges with cancer vaccine development. We've reviewed technical details of whole exome and whole transcriptome sequencing. We've also hopefully highlighted some of the benefits of a more optimized approach, such as the Personalis ACE platform. And we'd like to now take this a step further and discuss the importance of having a strong, robust analytical validation of both the assay and the informatics involved in this process. So I'll turn the talk over to Christelle now, and she will take you through this, this next topic. Great. Thank you so much, Erin, for this wonderful presentation and introduction. And I want to thank everyone again also for joining our webinar today. Um, I will start the second part of the presentation by discussing with you the analytical validation that Personalis has completed for whole exome and whole transcriptome assays, as well as the corresponding bioinformatics. And then demonstrate how these assays could be utilized to support cancer immunotherapy development. At Personalis, we do believe that neoantigen identification requires multimodality testing, and for us this is DNA and RNA sequencing with whole exome and whole transcriptome. We know that tumor and germline exome sequencing would allow analysis of coding regions with high sensitivity in detecting subclonal mutations, while RNA sequencing from the tumor verifies expressed mutations and expression levels and is also a powerful filter for translated mutations with likely functional consequences. We also recognize that developing analytically validated NGS assays is, is an important need, especially for the new generation of clinical trials of cancer vaccines. Whether it's a peptide-based, uh, RNA-based, or other designs, these personalized vaccines rely on patient genomic information so it's very critical to start with accurate data. The analytical validation of the ACE whole exome as well as whole transcriptome supports confident and accurate new antigen discovery for successful cancer vaccine development. And in the next few slides, I will share with you this approach that we've used and some of our results as well. So we have evaluated our um, ACE cancer exome assays which has a genomic footprint of 69.4 megabases with average sequencing depth of 200x across this footprint for the tumor and 75x average coverage for the matched normal sample. We have also pioneered analytical validation of the ACE cancer transcriptome assay for small variants and fusion events with an output of over 100 million total reads. This assay uses an exome capture enrichment method with proprietary ACE chemistry that Aaron described at the beginning of this talk. In addition, we've also validated the corresponding bioinformatics pipeline in parallel with the assay. The somatic analysis pipeline was validated using a tumor and matched normal sample. We then computed the positive percent agreement and the positive predictive value over a range of minor allele frequency mutations from less than 5% to over 95%. So we did face a major challenge when putting together a strategy for the analytical validation, and this is the lack of established gold standard reference samples that could be used as ground truth. We therefore generated our own internal gold standard and developed a validation approach that used well-characterized cancer cell lines to represent different tumor types as well as different types of variants. So for small variant validation um, at the DNA as well as RNA level, 
we obtained 11 cell lines representing different cancer types shown here in this table and 11 corresponding matched normal cell lines for this study. Both DNA and RNA were isolated from the samples and then the libraries were created using our ACE library preparation protocol. The libraries were sequenced on Illumina instrumentation using peers and weeds. And we used specific quality acceptance criteria for DNA and RNA sequencing as shown here in this table. For the DNA, we looked at the percent of reads that mapped to the reference genome. We looked at the duplication rate, the quality at the base, and the capture specificity. For the RNA, we looked at uniquely mapped reads, ribosomal RNA free reads, as well as other considerations. And these criteria shown here had to be met to proceed with downstream analysis of DNA and RNA. Now, as I mentioned, in the absence of an established reference standard for somatic mutations, we created our own gold set of small variant standards. And we defined our gold set as a set of cosmic verified events. This means that the identified variants were detected in a cosmic cell line project and also verified by two other sources, the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia and NCI60 database, or confirmed by Sanger sequencing. And in total, Across 11 cancer cell lines, the goal set we established for small variants included 875 single nucleotide variants and 19 insertions and deletions. Now, in the validation of the DNA small variants, we used these 11 specific cancer cell lines with the corresponding matched normal cell lines. We sequenced these 11 pairs and used our tumor normal somatic pipeline for analysis. We then compared these variant results to the gold set of variants and computed analytical sensitivity using this equation shown here at the bottom of the slide. We followed the same process for RNA small variant validation. Now for the RNA, and from a technical standpoint, um, RNA is a bit more difficult as there's varying expression of cancer genes, alternative splicing that can occur, RNA editing issues that also make RNA somatic variant detection more challenging. So to adjust for this, we filtered our RNA variants to those found in the DNA somatic pipeline, as well as the germline DNA variants. We then compared the list of the goal set of variants uh, to the goal set of variants, and then computed analytical sensitivity, also using this equation here. To look at our limit of detection for DNA small variants, we specifically used the following tumor normal cell line pairs. These were sequenced individually to establish a baseline. We then created different mixtures by combining the tumor and normal cell lines at different ratios to represent tumor purities from 5 to 80%. This also generated a range of mutations at various minor allele sequences from less than 5% to over 95%. And we sequenced all these dilutions, and from there, we determined the PPA and PPV. We also follow the same strategy for RNA small variants and use a different cell line pair to evaluate the limit of detection for the RNA. And this cell line is shown here also on the bottom of the slide. Now, as part of the RNA validation, in addition to small variants, we also evaluated fusion events. We identified well-characterized cell lines with fusion events corroborated by two independent studies. Across these 10 cancer cell lines, this gold set represented 16 unique fusion events. We sequenced all samples and computed sensitivity. Now for this type of variant, the number of unique reads supporting a fusion event was required to be greater than or equal to five. And from this plan, we are pleased to share these final results for the small variants. Overall, for FNVs and indels, the, uh, the overall sensitivity is 98% and 95% respectively. And what we've done here in this second table is show the PPA and PPV for the limit of detection parsed out for the FNVs and indels results, as well as the value overall for small variants at 10% minor allele frequency and also 20% minor allele frequency. 
And for the AIDS cancer transcriptome, we have an overall sensitivity for small variants of 97%. And for the fusions with multiple lines of evidence, the analytical sensitivity was calculated to be 100%. For RNA small variant limit of detection, um, we have also shown here the PPA, parsed out for a 10% and a 20% minor allele frequency. Again, you can see the results from the analytical validation of the AIDS cancer exome and transcriptome are excellent with high sensitivity and high specificity. So we are confident that this analytical validation for our assays provides high sensitivity for neoantigen discovery for cancer vaccine development and forms the foundation of our ACE immunity offering with neoantigen prediction. The ACE ID combines the strength of our ACE exome and transcriptome in a tumor normal configuration where the tumor is sequenced at 200x, the normal at 75x, and the transcriptome at 100 million total reads. Results from the exome and transcriptome now feed into our newly developed neoantigen discovery pipeline that provides comprehensive data on putative neoepitopes. This service is available for research within 46 weeks turnaround time. We also provide an expedited service of 14 calendar days in our PIA certified and CAF accredited labs to meet the requirements for clinical trials. Now, how might the ACE immuno ID be utilized to benefit cancer immunotherapy? We know that there is a lot that can be learned from a tumor biopsy to guide the development of successful therapies. At Personalis, our enhanced genomic solutions help interrogate DNA and RNA from each biopsy sample. DNA analysis provides information on different types of variants, and these could be single nucleotide variants and insertions and deletions. RNA analysis, when cross-referenced with the DNA calls, serve as a powerful filter to detect variants that are actually expressed in the tumor, but also provide additional data on gene expression, gene fusion, and different isoforms. Now, this specific information, patient-specific information, can then be utilized to individualize immunotherapy care against tumor-specific vulnerabilities. And from one genomic data set, we enable multiple analyses. And these could range from assessing tumor mutational burden, distinguishing native antigens from new antigens, identifying new antigen loads, evaluating expression status of immune checkpoint ligands, differential expression analysis that could also allow the identification of a gene signature of response or resistance to therapy. The data set also enables discovery of novel transcripts implicated in disease and detection of known and novel fusion events. So collectively, this information helps support the development of more efficacious and truly personalized therapies such as cancer vaccines, but it also provides data for the study of immune checkpoint blockades and agonists. It provides material for translational research and discovery for study of resistance mechanisms, for example, and also helps inform combination therapies. Now, with regards to cancer vaccines, one of the keys to personalized cancer vaccine therapy is identifying the unique set of new antigens for individual patients for accurate and efficacious vaccine design. This could be achieved with the ACE immune ID, where a cancer sample, which could be a single tumor biopsy, or even multiple biopsies from the same tumor to better represent tumor heterogeneity and neoantigen clones. It's paired with a matched normal sample. This normal sample could be in the form of whole blood, PBMC, or even adjacent tissue from the same patient and these are sequenced with the ACE cancer exome. This paired sequencing data is then analyzed through our paired somatic analysis pipeline. This generates a set of all somatic variants that are predicted to cause a protein coding change that could ultimately result in a neoantigen. We then use the RNA derived from the same sample from which we extracted the DNA to perform ACE transcriptome sequencing. The ACE transcriptome, as Erin described in the beginning of this talk, it features the same augmented design as the exome, but targets the RNA instead. Variants are called in the RNA as well, 
And then cross-reference with the somatic variants called in the DNA. And this gives us the set of all somatic variants that are actually expressed and therefore serve as a potential new antigen set. Now, the ACE chemistry we use as a foundation for all of our assays has enabled higher sensitivity and increased yield for discovery of potential new antigens. And I'm showing here examples from a skin cancer sample on the top and a lung cancer sample analyzed in-house. The mutations here are indicated in red, the red lines, and are identified in regions that have benefited substantially from personalized proprietary chemistry, the regions here in green. And these have been confirmed both at the DNA and RNA level. Now, it's quite possible that these variants may have been undetected by a standard assay, the blue here, while ACE provides substantial coverage to confidently call variants wherever they fall on a gene. We achieve this type of uniformity in coverage and high sensitivity for new antigen discovery for every cancer sample. Now, as far as the deliverables from the ACE Immuno ID offering, this here is a complete list of deliverables returned from the DNA sequencing. In addition to raw files, we also generate somatic variant analysis, um, analysis files and various plots and statistical summaries for a comprehensive reporting for each sample. Uh, for the RNA, we provide similar deliverables as well. In addition to data on expressed variants, you will also receive information on gene regulation and expression, gene fusion detected in the sample as well. We are very excited to announce the launch of our new antigen prediction algorithm for research use. This pipeline we've developed will take into account information from the ACE exome and transcriptome, as well as HLA typing input, and various additional parameters to rank and score new antigens in the most accurate way. The new antigen prediction pipeline will return data on tumor mutational burden and new antigen load. The summary report shown here um, will show metrics on peptide MHC binding affinity with expression status derived from the transcriptome results. It will also show the range of affinity observed. Also in the summary report, we will show the top 10 peptides ranked based on binding affinity. Now, in addition, a corresponding output report in a standard Excel format will be delivered to allow you to rapidly sort uh, on your project-specific criteria, and it provides a list uh, of unranked peptides. With these deliverables, we will also include an interactive tab displaying high-level metrics that are helpful for triaging critical samples. So to evaluate the performance of the new antigen prediction pipeline that we've developed and the accuracy in identifying predicted HLA-bound peptides, we started with a proof of principle experiment where we used a well-established set of peptides known to be immunogenic and elicit T-cell response. So we took those peptides and reverse engineered the variants they are derived from and used these corresponding variants to spike into a data set of cancer samples that we sequenced in-house. We then ran this data set on our cancer somatic pipeline followed by the neoantigen pipeline. We had identified 23 known peptides from the database listed here at the bottom of the slide, and were able to detect 22 out of the 23 peptides with accurate HLA binding and the corresponding mutations at the DNA and RNA level as well. So our overall sensitivity in predicting HLA bound peptides in this specific experiment was 96%. Now, in addition to developing robust assays for immuno-oncology studies, we've also brought together a highly experienced operations and software engineering team to build a strong infrastructure and enable processing of critical patient samples in a timely fashion. Just quickly to show you here the journey a sample will take from beginning to end, we created an enterprise-scale genomics information management platform that safely streamlines this entire workflow. In addition to tracking your samples in real time, our proprietary software system enables us to lock in content and versions of the bioinformatics pipeline and easily enable reanalysis later if needed. 
once we receive the sample, you are immediately contacted by and assigned a dedicated project manager who provides communication alerts via email. Sample information will be entered into our LIMS and genomic management system, followed by initiation of extraction and pathology review. The pathology service and DNA RNA extraction steps will be performed in parallel. Results such as tumor content, immunohistochemistry staining, HLA typing, and the extraction QC results are all communicated to the customer before proceeding to the next step. This is then followed by library preparation and QC assessment. We then proceed to sequencing, bioinformatic analysis, which is possible in multiple configurations, and then delivery of the data. And this includes review and assistance by field application scientists to help you navigate through the data sets, the file structures, as well as the content of, of the hard drive. This process is typically available within four to six turnaround, weeks turnaround time. However, for clinical trials of cancer vaccines, where the genomic data set is critical to obtain for the design of the vaccine, we complete this entire workflow from sample receipt to data delivery in 14 calendar days. And in summary, we have built augmented assays that benefit the field of cancer immunotherapy and have also developed a strong infrastructure that supports immuno-oncology clinical trials. Our labs are CAS accredited and PIA certified, and we're able to provide an expedited turnaround time of results and scale our operations to automation. Our assays are co-developed with the bioinformatic pipelines by experienced scientists. We provide documentation and chain of custody for every sample through our enterprise scale genomic information management platform that allows us to lock in content and pipeline versions for clinical trials. Also, our PhD level project managers and field application scientists will help provide high level of support for every project. Hopefully, we've been able to provide you with a nice overview of personalis and the company's capabilities. We've addressed critical challenges in the NGS process, and we aim to provide accurate data sets from every cancer sample with flexibility in how we report the data to meet the needs of every project and clinical trial. We do welcome your feedback, comments, and questions. Please reach out to the field application scientist team at info at personalis.com for any inquiries. Thank you all very much for listening again. Erin and I would be happy to take some questions right now. Well, thank you very much for that insightful presentation. And now I would like our audience to continue sending in their questions or comments right now using the questions window for the Q&A session of the webinar. And we have already received, received some questions, so I'll go ahead and get started with those. And the first question we have here is, do you need a match normal sample for your process? And what types of specimens are accepted for normals? Great, okay, thank you, Vicki. So, yeah, having the matched normal will definitely increase the specificity of the somatic analysis. For particular applications such as our ACE immuno ID for neoantigen detection, we recommend and have performed our analytical validation using a matched normal. Simultaneous analysis of the normal allows for reduced false positive calls and more accurate detection of tumor specific somatic mutations. Now, that said, for other assays and applications, we do have versatile modes for bioinformatics analysis within our, within our cancer pipeline. In the absence of a normal sample, uh, we do use a proxy normal data set of variants and a panel of normal samples that we sequence in-house. Uh, and as far as the types of specimens that are accepted for the normal, um, we, do, we are able to work with whole blood, PBMCs, as well as a normal adjacent tissue. Perfect. Thank you for that, Dr. Johnson. And the next question we have here is, what deliverables are provided and what options are there for delivery? Great. Yeah, so for all our DNA and RNA assays, we do return a complete data set that includes all raw data files, fast queues, alignment files, and a BAM format the variant calls, full annotation, as well as filtered annotation reports by cancer relevant. Uh, with the RNA analysis, we provide gene fusion information as well as gene expression reports. 
And for both DNA and RNA, we provide QC reports and statistics on the sequencing run. Now, for the ACE Immune ID product that we described today, we provide everything I just mentioned in addition to the output from the new antigen prediction pipeline in the form of a summary report and a corresponding Excel data sheet for the list of new epitopes. Um, I also would like to mention that we are capable of working with you on how the data is delivered and also have capabilities of customizing reports to meet the needs of specific projects or clinical trials. And for the delivery me method, uh, the full data set can be delivered via secure electronic transfer, or we can also ship a physical hard drive overnight. Perfect. Thank you for that answer. And I think we have time for one more question. And this question is, how do you determine where to supplement with ACE? Great. Th thanks, Vicki. I could take that one. So. Um, now at Personalis, we're in our, our third generation of the ACE exome design. So what we've done is we've really done a great job up front is that we've surveyed genome-wide where there's problematic regions in the genome and, and where the standard chemistry fails in those regions. So we've looked, you know, by, by surveying a large group of samples where areas like GC-rich regions are and the standard chemistries fail. And as I, I showed a few kind of what we call our blue-green plots, like the SDK11 gene, where you saw some of these gaps in the standard assay. So, so we, we look for these types of areas. We also use our annotation databases. So we, we pull from over 40 different databases. We use sources like ICCG and others that help us to guide us where these critical cancer, pharmacogenomic, Mendelian, and other biomedically relevant genes reside. And we then look to those genes and those areas for, for targeting for more complete coverage with the ACE proprietary design. Perfect. Thank you for that answer, Dr. Newburn. And we have unfortunately reached the end of the Q&A portion of this webinar, and I would like to thank both of you very much for those answers. And if you do have any further questions, please direct them to the email address showing on your screen, and that's info at personalis.com. And thank you everyone for participating in today's conference. You will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with the access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen shortly and your participation is greatly appreciated as it will help us to improve our future webinars. Now please join us in thanking our speakers, Dr. Aaron Newburn and Dr. Christelle Johnson. We hope you have found this conference informative. Have a great day everyone.